summer, I was able to hear a presentation on the topic of human trafficking. And before that time, I thought I was fairly aware of the problem of trafficking and of the details of it. Um, it, and also knew that I learned along the way here from our wonderful Not For Sale Club, which focuses on trying to inform us about trafficking and helping prevent it. But what I found in that presentation this summer was that I knew very little. I was shocked. I was immediately aware of how critical it would be to get the information that I was being uh, privileged to hear to the Catholic High family, to students, to parents, to faculty because the problem of human trafficking is so dangerous, so pervasive, so common. And every single person in this room who is not out of school yet could be a victim of trafficking at any time, girl or guy, in your home, in your neighborhood, at the mall. It happens quickly, it happens surprisingly. You'll hear all about that today. And every single person in this room who's not yet 18 will be in less than four years. And when you reach that age, while you will no longer be subject so much to being trafficked, you will be one of the people who can help to prevent trafficking. Recognize it and know what to do to help stop it, if you are aware. So awareness is the key. Being able to know what it is, see it, recognize it for what it is, and do something about it. So today, we're very blessed to have a speaker who's going to help us gain that insight and information. Her name is Mrs. Jessica Wilkins. She is a native of St. Louis, Missouri, a wonderful city if you haven't been there yet, and uh, a professional in the social work area. She has a passion and has all of her life for helping people, especially children, reach their full potential. And thus, over the years of her professional career, she's worked for what in Missouri is called Children's Division. Here we call it the Department of Children and Family Services, the state agency that works to prevent and take care of children. She also has worked in a program for fatherhood to try to inspire and develop strong fatherhood. And she's worked in several residential facilities for children as a social worker. Three years ago, she was employed by an agency that is rare. And it is named the Covering House, and its specific mission is to help female youths between the ages of 14, or perhaps 13, and 18, who have been trafficked, who have been freed from trafficking, but now have to recover and become healthy young women. So she has tremendous experience and knowledge about the topic of trafficking. Not like me just from reading something or hearing about it, but from working firsthand with the problem of human trafficking. And therefore, we are very blessed to have her come this morning all the way from St. Louis to share that knowledge and expertise with us. So at this time, I ask you to help me to welcome Ms. Jessica Wilkins, our speaker today. Um, my name is Jessica Wilkins. I hail from St. Louis, Missouri, born and bred. Um, and I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you all this morning on this topic. Um, with that being said, I do know this can be a heavy topic. It can be, it can bring up a lot of emotions. So if you feel the need to speak to someone when we are done talking today, you have your chaplain and you have your counseling center. So please feel free to utilize those if you see fit and do not be afraid to do so. It is nothing wrong with needing to have those conversations, um, which is part of the reason I am here, because this is a conversation that needs to be had. And I really want to make it a conversation. I don't want to talk the entire time. So that requires some audience participation. So please don't all speak at once when I give that opportunity. <laughs> Um, so I guess we're going to go ahead and get started. So the Covering House. Our mission is to provide refuge and restoration using the least restrictive environment for sexually exploited and trafficked teens and children, providing safety, dignity, and freedom while utilizing top-level staffing and oversight. 
So, like Sister was saying, we have a residential facility where we house young ladies ages 13 to 17. And all of those young ladies have experienced some kind of sexual trafficking or exploitation. So what we do is work with them so they can heal, from, heal, but also kind of get back into normal life to where they don't have that, thing, that trafficking hanging over them. Right now, like I said, our facility has five beds, but part of the reason I'm here is because the order so graciously donated some property to us up in St. Louis. So we are going to go from a five bed facility to a 12 bed facility. So we will be able to take in a lot more kiddos and help them. And we will be eventually taking in young men, um, members of the LGBT community, all of those kinds of things because we have so much land to do so. The program that we have is actually written by, it was written by us. It was written by us with the help of an adult survivor. She influenced what it is that she believed that victims of trafficking needed to heal. So it's very specific to that kind of trauma. We also have our community-based services. So a lot of the things that we do with the young ladies at the house, we try to provide those services to other victims in the community where they might not need to come and live with us, but we can go to them and still provide them those very specific counseling and therapies and things like that. And then we also have our prevention program, which is a, another reason I am here, because I am the manager of that program, which we call Reducing the Risk. And so and within that program, what I try to do is talk to students, teachers, faculty, and parents, and just educate. Because when you know better, you do better, right? All right, I see some head nods, so that works. I'm not going to stand in front of this thing the entire time, so. So, <laughs> so that is this time, my first opportunity for participation. When you guys hear sex trafficking, what's the first thing that comes to mind? You guys just kind of start shouting because it's too many questions. Kidnapping. Kidnapping. I heard sex. Girls. Girls. Boys. White man. Prostitution. White man. White man. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Abuse. I'm going to need a lot of volume on that. We hear them. Say what? Awareness of sex. Never coming back. Never coming back. That's the first one. I've never heard that one. Crime. Rape. Rape. Drug addiction. So, surprisingly, nobody says what most people say. Take it. As much as I love that movie, as much as I am a fan, that's not the only way that trafficking happens. So a lot of people brought up things like kidnapping, the white man, and um, crime and never coming back, prostitution, drug addiction. Those all are a part of trafficking. But what I want to do is maybe help give you a little bit more realistic idea of what it is. Again, I love taking, but it's a little sensationalized. So we're just going to have some conversation so I can show you some different ways that it can happen. So this is our federal definitions for trafficking. Now, for gun and human trafficking, there is both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. However, our organization works specifically with victims of sexual trafficking. So this long definition, um, this is the legal definition that can be used in court to charge someone. It is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining a person for the purposes of a commercial sex act in which the commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. So, outside of my faculty and staff in the room, and myself, do we have any, and the parents and grandparents and friendly and friends, do we have any students that are 18 in here? Okay. So, in this instance, you would still actually fit 
in this definition. The most important thing is to remember from this definition, commercial sex act. A commercial sex act is exchanging anything that brings for some kind of sexual gratification for something else. It does not always have to be money, but we normally think that it does. The second part to really pick out of that is the forced water coercion. Those are all elements of manipulation. Now, it's very hard to prove that in a court of law because that requires somebody's testimony. If I traffic guns or drugs, if you were to catch me with those things, there's your evidence. There's your case. But I've heard a detective in St. Louis tell me it's with sexual trafficking, if you do not have a willing victim, you, a willing victim to speak, you do not have a case. And because of that forced fraud and coercion that's taking place, most of the time they won't testify against their traffickers. It's something kind of like Stockholm Syndrome. They feel they've developed this relationship with this person and they do not want to betray their trust. We'll talk about that a little later. And then the 18 years of age piece. So if you are 18 or younger and this happens to you, you are automatically deemed a victim. Which is hard for some people to believe. And we'll get into why. Just now. Oh, not now. Sorry. So commercial sexual exploitation of children is also a term that's being used a lot more than sexual trafficking. That, that is being used because it helps kind of broaden the idea of what most people think of as trafficking. Because it seems like most people kind of think of strictly sex or prostitution, sex work kind of things. Though that's a direct form of trafficking. But under CSEC, there's also considered indirect forms of trafficking. Um, that include stripping, pornography, webcamming, escort, escort services, as well as sexting. I got a hand over there. I thought human trafficking didn't have the age. It does, it does not. However, with the definition, the legal definition, it gives special protection to minors. So you know how there are a lot of laws here in, within the United States that do not allow minors to make decisions for themselves and things like that. So that's kind of why they put that in place. Just like with DC, DCFS. So they're, they're charged to protect, uh, protect minors from, from abuse. So that's why they put that piece in there. Because it's deemed that anyone under that age would not necessarily willingly go and do something like this. Does that make sense? And please feel free to ask questions. I'm sorry, I, I normally say that to you. Um, let's go to the next one, I forgot my talk. Exploitation, we include exploitation because again, it helps broaden what most people think of as trafficking. Because all trafficking is some kind of form of exploitation. It is somebody benefiting from the work of somebody else. However, not all exploitation is trafficking. So it can get a little, a little muddy right there. So this is my favorite part. We're going to go through some examples. And what I want you to do is tell me if you think that it's trafficking, if you would identify it as exploitation, or you're just not really sure, but something is weird. So this first one we have here. We have a single mom, she came home from work early, and she was coming in the door, two young men were running out of her front door, pulling up their pants. So she decides she, she's gonna go talk to her daughter and figure out what's going on. Her daughter's defense is to shut down, so no talking. She's just kind of blankly staring. Mom continues to feel like something happened to her child didn't want to happen. So mom goes to law enforcement. She's saying, she lets them know what happened. Law enforcement tells her, yeah, we know who they are. We'll go and talk to them. Law enforcement goes and talks to the young men and they say it was consensual. So nothing else happens. With that information, what, how do you guys feel? What do you think? It's wrong, is that what I heard? Anybody else? Yes, sir. One more time. That's a good one. He said the police should have spoken to the young lady that this happened to as well. 
It never got to that point. Yes, sir. Sometimes, something that he asked wouldn't make it, make it worse for the victim to talk about it. Sometimes it does, but sometimes it can be very empowering for them as well. Well, something that we do specifically, we do not tell someone that they are a victim. We work with them to realize that something has been done against, some, somebody has wronged them in some kind of way, and let them kind of get to their own <coughs> realization that they were a victim. But we also don't leave them there. Within the covering house, we are very big on moving from victimization. So we go from being a victim to a warrior, to a survivor, to a thriver. Because eventually, that, that just, we don't want people to keep their identity wrapped up in that victimization. So we try to work with them to get to the point where they realize that I am a person, I have my own rights, and I have my own feelings and opinions, and, that, and that's okay. Let me throw a couple more details. So this young lady was 14, the young men were 16 or 18. Catch a case. Yes, catch a case for that 18 year old. So a couple more details. This happened to her in July. Um, the previous school year, she actually went to a private Catholic school in St. Louis. Um, and she had kind of been labeled as a troublemaker. She did little silly stuff in class, just to do it. Um, when school started in August, those behaviors increased. But the previous school year, she was captain of the basketball team. She played in viola. Um, she was involved in church youth group. She was considered an AB student. This whole time, mom was steady going to the school saying, I think something happened and I need some help. The school kind of just brushed it off because she had already been labeled a troublemaker and was doing little things in class to get attention and be disruptive. So it came to be December when she was no longer involved in any of her <coughs> activities and became a DF student that the school felt that mom was actually telling the truth, that something really was happening. So they sent her to someone to talk to. That person couldn't figure it out, so they sent her to us. What ended up coming out is her boyfriend was using her to settle his debts on the street. He had a drug habit that he couldn't afford. So he would tell, people, he would tell the dealers, you can go get whatever you need for my girlfriend however you see fit. What do we think now? Trafficking. A jerk, yes. That too. <laughs> but so this is, this is trafficking. And it doesn't look like taking. Because it seems like she willingly went. Or she willingly participated. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's go to this one. This is a shot. D is 12 years old. She has been in constant communication with older men, engaging in erotic conversation via text and social media. She and one man in particular have expressed such deep love for each other that they have decided to meet. What are your thoughts? I hear the, oh. Sketchy. Oh, okay. I can't think of anything anybody can say. I don't get that reference. Ah, yes. So, clearly this has stirred some kind of reaction in everyone. This young lady, I've seen these conversations that she's had, that she's had with this, this man. She is, again, she's 12. The man she was having a conversation with is 40. <laughs> you think you make the same phrase on me? <laughs> yes. So, luckily, luckily we were able to get involved before he was able to get to her. He had plans to actually drive, because he's not from Missouri, had plans to drive to Missouri and pick this young lady up. However, law enforcement,
intercepted him before he could get out of his home state. Thank goodness.
She has graduated from college with her associate's degree and is planning on going on getting her bachelor's degree in nursing. Um, she is still involved with us and she still does counseling and things like that. But her story took a left turn. This started for her in junior high. And somebody decided to give her a little bit more information to go out there and do some more things. So she got a fake ID and went to what we call East St. Louis to work in the strip clubs. She was doing that by the time she was a freshman. So it kind of spiraled out of control for her very quickly. Because somebody kept planting new seeds to exploit her. But again, luckily, this is one of our better cases. We were able to intervene when we did, and she has maintained what she has learned and is doing very well. So how do we feel after all these? Gross, shocked, those are normally what I get. But I just wanted to give you guys a real, a real idea of what else trafficking can look like besides safety. Again, all of these are real cases. I know every single one of these girls. I've worked with every single one of these girls. And they're just as real as what people believe taking is. So, next step, some statistics. Now, the issue with statistics on trafficking, A, everybody says something different because they track things differently. B, it's still a super underreported crime. So these numbers might not be completely accurate and we really have no way to check. There's not a lot of research in the specific numbers around trafficking. But I think they are still very impactful. So human trafficking is a $32 billion industry globally. And that does include both sex and labor trafficking. The newest number I saw with human trafficking is a $150 billion industry worldwide. That actually came from an FBI agent herself. In the U.S., it's reported that we are responsible for $9.5 billion of that global intake annually. So it's happening right here in the U.S. A report by the Urban Institute estimated that the underground sex economy in just eight U.S. cities generated 39.9 million to 290 million. That's just eight cities out of our entire nation. In 2017, NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, they responded to 10,000 reports of possible child sexual trafficking. That's just the, the, the cases involving minors. And then in 2017, they had 140 cases of sexual trafficking reported to their hotline. Oh, I'm sorry, 140 cases. And of those 140, there were 109 cases involving sex trafficking. So a case for the National Human Trafficking Hotline is a call that comes in that generates the need for services. People get tips all the time. However, if there requires more assessment and some kind of resource referral, that's what constitutes the case for the National Human Trafficking Hotline. There are reportedly up to 300,000 children trafficked in the U.S., and that number grows daily. My concern with that number, because it's from the FBI, that is only cases that reach federal jurisdiction. We have served 31 young ladies at our residential facilities since 2014. Only four of those cases have met federal jurisdiction. So 26 of my kids don't get counted in that number. So I really think that number is a lot larger. The average age of entry into commercial sexual exploitation for a child victim is 13. Think about what you were doing at 13. On average, the clients that are referred to us are 15. So we think that 13 may be right because we work in what we call aftercare. We come in after something has already happened. So 13 seems about right. But I've seen in literature everything from 12 to 16 being their first experience. 
A pimp can make 150000 to 200000 per child each year. And the average pimp or trafficker has four to six girls. I think I did the math. I think that's 1.2 million a year. All of us who have upstanding jobs and are productive citizens to society will probably never see that amount of money in our lifetime, let alone annually. And I also have student loans. So that's a little upsetting to me. One in seven teens on the street will be lured into prostitution within 48 hours of leaving home. They end up in situations that we like to call um, survival sex. If you leave, if you run away, or if you're put out of your home, you usually don't take a lot of things with you. However, you need your basic needs met. You need some place to sleep. You need some place to be warm. You need some place to bed. You need something to eat. And sometimes they're put in those situations where the only thing that they have to trade is their body in order to get those things. Additionally, 48% of runaway and homeless youth who engaged in commercial sex activity said they did it because they just didn't have a safe place to stay. So, the Department of Justice identified the most intense human trafficking jurisdictions in the country. So the top 20, here we go. Houston, El Paso, LA, Atlanta, Chicago, Charlotte, Miami, Las Vegas, New York, Long Island, New Orleans, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Phoenix, Richmond, San Diego, San Francisco, St. Louis, Seattle, and Tampa. So, you all have, within the state of Florida, two cities on this list. Why do you think that is? Close to Mexico is what I heard. Cuba. Close to the coast. Tourism. Bingo. Bingo. <laughs> not that the other issues were not correct, but tourism makes it a lot easier to happen because people are coming and going a lot more. So, according to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, in 2017, Florida was the third highest destination for reported human trafficking cases in the U.S. So, they received a total of 1,601 calls. Mm -hmm. Of those calls, 604 cases were generated. Out of those cases, 402 were specific for sexual trafficking. Law 137 were for labor, and then 33 experience, reported experiencing both sex and labor trafficking. And then 32 did not identify what kind of trafficking they experienced. And this is all just within the state of Florida last year. So, according to the Florida Department of Health, one in nine high school students will be approached for some kind of sexual excuse me, sexual exploitation, while one in three middle school students will be approached. And what I read was that they're being approached through the internet. Social media is huge, because it, it allows you to con have contact with people that you normally wouldn't. <coughs> so we, again, be mindful of your internet use. Sorry. So, so since some, some of our statistics, we as an agency keep our own statistics because we can say that we have the proof to back them up. So 100% of the girls came to us with gaps in their education. So a lot of the times they miss a lot of school because they're made to be up all night or what, what have you so they don't go to school or they're running away. 60% experience some kind of somatic symptom at some point in their stay with us. So they're having things like chronic headaches, chronic stomach aches, um, chronic body aches, they don't have a medical reason. It's all because their body is in fight or flight. And they're, they're constantly fighting, their body is constantly fighting. So it kind of begins to fight itself. They believe that they're in danger all the time. Ooh. 85 to 90% of our ladies were lured into 
lured into exploitation through a relationship, while only 10, 10 to 15 percent have been through forced or strong arm trafficking. So, again, I don't want to say that situations like taking do not happen. However, what we have experienced is most of the young ladies that we work with reported that whoever exploited them was somebody that they knew, somebody they had a relationship with, whether it had been a boyfriend or girlfriend, um, just a friend, a family member, somebody that they knew. It wasn't necessarily the white man kind of situation. 40% of our clients identify as LGBTQ, 50% are African American, and over 50% have been in the system for over two years. And by the system, I mean um, foster care, um, involved with what we call juvenile detention, those kinds of things. So some more specific things to trafficking. Who is vulnerable? I think the better question is who is not vulnerable? Because even as adults, sometimes they're still vulnerable. However, there's something very unique about a youth in this situation. So if you see individuals disconnected from family or school, if it seems like they kind of live in isolation, if they have an increased need for money, if there's a strong or abnormal desire for material things, if they have a history of trauma or abuse, substance abuse issues, somebody can use that to control them, low self-esteem, and a need for love and acceptance. As humans, we desire human, we desire human connection with others. So that can make somebody vulnerable if they have a very strong desire to have some special connection with somebody because they do not have it with anyone in particular. Lack of experience with healthy relationships. We are creatures that model behavior. If we have not seen a good and healthy relationship, we believe, we, we create our idea of what a relationship is supposed to look like based off of the things and experiences that we know of. Everybody has their relationship goals. They're all over the internet. So be mindful. If someone may be living in an unstable, unstable living condition, if they move around a lot, potentially. So not wonder all of these things make somebody vulnerable. However, they might make you look a little closer. Did I want to prostitute my body away to strange men? She said, no. I wanted to be loved by someone. I wanted a male in my life to show me care. This is how I thought I had to do it. This is a quote from a 14-year-old victim. And I think this just continues to show that if you don't know what you you don't know what a relationship is supposed to look like, you'll fall for anything. So where do they recruit? Again, my question more so where do they not recruit? Um, schools, hallways, court buildings, foster homes, bus stations, homeless shelters, restaurants, bars, parks, and playgrounds, and malls. So what's actually been happening that we've been seeing is that it's not the creepy old guy that most people think. They send someone in that's less threatening, whether it be a woman or another child. We have seen a couple of cases where they have sent an, um, a peer in to start this conversation and kind of lure them into some kind of trap. The recruiting tactics. Again, the internet is huge. If the internet made talking to people who you wouldn't normally have contact with and buying and selling things a lot easier, unfortunately, also, it also did the same thing with people. It made it a lot easier to buy and sell people. If there are some classified ads, looking for models, actresses, or promising a good job, sometimes those aren't truthful. So, some specific Florida information. There were 40 arrested in a human trafficking and, and a victim recovered in Lake County. How far is Lake County from here? 
Six, seven hour drive. Okay. So, the Lake County Sheriff's Office, they did kind of a two part study. So, they put up a couple of fake ads for a couple of fake sexual ads for a 14 year old. And these six men here, they responded to that. So they were arrested. But then under operation, this phase two, these were all that were involved in that ad going up. Or, excuse me, these were individuals that posted ads. And in that, I believe there was a 17 year old in the ads that these people put up. So in Orlando, three men were charged with human trafficking of an underage girl. Can you please say that for me? Osceola. Osceola County. I was about to put that. <laughs> um, so the, young, the gentleman on the right is Timothy White. He had a 17-year-old with him. Um, he lured her in through um, the promise of a modeling job. She met him at a hotel after she ran away and he took pictures of her and it kind of exploded from there. He started putting those pictures out in ads on the internet for people to, to purchase her for sex. And that was this, it happened last year but he was charged July 16th of this year. So how do children fall into the lifestyle? Some are trafficked into the country. Some are abducted. A lot are sold by family and friends. If they're poor and they just need money, sometimes they feel that that's the only way that they have to do it. And they're, they kind of continue it because their family puts it on them to kind of keep bringing that money in. Sometimes we, we've had cases involving parents that are struggling with drug addiction and they use that to maintain their habits. Runaways and throwaways. So what we consider throwaway kids are those kids that get kicked out of home. Again, they have that they have to go into survival mode. So again, they trade what they do have, which is normally just their person, for safety. We talked about the internet, we talked about survival sex. So the boyfriend, Romeo or Fernandez Pimp. That's just a fancy way of saying some kind of romantic relationship that went super south. So, there is a process called grooming and breaking. <laughs> so, I like to describe it, I don't even like to read all that, but how I like to describe it is you get into a relationship with this person. It's the greatest relationship you've ever had. You feel like they understand you, they're super supportive. They want to down you. You get everything that you need and want from this individual. And that happens for a little while. They make you believe that you are the most important person in their life and that it is the two of you against the world. I understand you going through that hard situation, but don't worry. I'm here to help you. I'm here to support you. Whatever you need, babe, I got you. And that becomes this. It is impossible to protect girls from guys like me, like I was, because that's what we do. We eat, drink, and sleep of ways to trick young girls into doing what we want them to do. That's a direct quote from a former pimp. So again, they build you all the way up and give you the opportunity to feel that you're on cloud nine before they bring you here to the seasoning. It's a breaking down of the team from sexual, healthy sexual adolescent boundaries to commercial sex with strangers. It is, this has been researched and documented, and it is done nationwide. Again, the building them up to only pull the rug out from underneath them. And this whole system is about gaining complete control over an individual, especially their identity. We had a young lady, she could not choose what, she couldn't pick out an outfit because somebody had told her what to do, what to wear, how to talk, where to go, all of those things. So they take that away from them. They take that individuality away from the person. So 
Something that's huge is called, we call it red ends. They will literally get tattoos that kind of, that signify that they belong to a certain person. This young lady here, at the bottom, any side of her lip, it says Ricky. I believe this is a hip, tat hip tattoo here, and it says property of Selene. Sometimes they are that overt, overt, but sometimes they are a little hidden. Um, we, we've seen a lot of tattoos with a crown on them and initials or somebody's name. That means that that individual owns them and is the king. And I've actually seen actual literal barcodes on people. Um, so how do, how do they do the seasoning? So how do they pull that look out from underneath it? Some of the techniques that are used, of course, there's the physical stuff. Beating, burning, sexual assault. There's the uh, confinement. I never actually thought about that. But if you really think about it, they use solitary confinement in the prison system. So I can only imagine what it would do to some to a, to a child. Withholding food or water, emotional abuse, threats is huge. threats are huge in maintaining that manip that manipulation and that power differential. Oh, I, you you know I know where I got you from. I know where you live. Don't make me go back and get your sister. You're going to keep doing what I need you to do, or I'm going to go and get her to do it. Or I know where your grandma lives. You're going to keep doing what I need you to do, or I'm going to go see her. Creating dependencies. We have one young lady. Um, her trafficker started off as her boyfriend, and I use that term here. Boyfriend. He got her addicted to cocaine at 16 and was able to maintain his control over her youth through the cocaine. Um, moving into a new location where they don't know anyone. Taking identification and then sexual conditioning. Those are all ways to break someone. So what can you do as students? Now it's time, now that you know better, we're gonna do better. So here's what we can do. Watch for these red flags. Not one or even all of these things constitute that someone is being trafficked, but again, it may require you to pay a little bit more attention. If they're not allowed to speak for themselves, if they appear helpless, shamed, and or nervous, or they avoid eye contact. Now, you also have to take into account that this is a cultural thing. In the U.S., we're very direct. If I'm talking to you, I'm looking you directly in your eyes, all those kind of things. There are some cultures where that is not considered appropriate. So keep that in mind. Um, if there are signs of physical abuse, anytime there are signs of any kind of physical abuse, we want to get involved and get them some help. If a young person suddenly has clothes and items that they can't afford and are fascinated with the top of the line designer items, I get it. We want stuff. I understand that. But if out of nowhere someone has a lot of things that you know that they normally wouldn't, you might want to look a little more. They have an extravagant appearance. A lot of men's clothes, for whatever reason in St. Louis, the thing is, or it was belt buckles, like huge, gaudy kind of belt buckles. If they demonstrate grooming behaviors, if all they talk about is this grand relationship that they have, and that becomes the most important thing to them. Everything that they were doing before this relationship is no longer important to them. If there's a new addiction to drugs or alcohol, or if there's a new tattoo that seems kind of awkward, and that kind of came out of nowhere. But again, not one or all of these automatically mean that someone is being trafficked, but they might warrant a little bit more assessment. So what do you do if you suspect trafficking? Do not approach them because there's usually somebody nearby that's watching them and it could put them in greater danger. But there are a couple numbers there if you would like to, uh, I don't know if you all have your phones. I normally tell people to take a picture of this slide. If not, I will most definitely make this information available to you all. So there's the National Human Trafficking Hotline.
the U.S. Department of Justice hotline, the Florida Abuse Line, and you can always go to your local authorities. Because he loved her. When you don't know yourself and 
You don't love yourself. You won't fall for anything that sounds like love and feels like love. She was a walking corpse stained with the fingerprints of strangers. The all she wanted was to walk the earth without the heaviness, the weight of all the men who tore a piece of her and took it with them. She never made it to see her 18th birthday. This is for the pain, for the sins that bad water won't wash away, for the scars of the hearts of the fatherless child. This is for the girls objectified instead of praised like queens. This is for the agony. Growing up without a father, but all you really want is love, and you don't understand love. So one day when some guy stops you in a train station or a street corner and tells you you're beautiful, you are quickly intrigued. You like the fact that someone notices you, and you will do anything to feel like it's everything, and he promises you everything, and the things he convinces you to do, they don't seem that bad, and afterwards he shows you how much he loves you. Your morals are abandoned on that sidewalk where you turn your first trip. Your beauty is left in that hotel room where some stranger touched you like his girlfriend and then left the money on the nightstand. And every night, you die again, compromising your worth for what your pimp calls love and security. The hustle, the streetlights, the schemes, it never seems worth it, but you have the liquor to comfort your fears. And as long as your profits meet expectations, you will have what you always wanted your whole life. Love. Love that doesn't feel right, but it's all you think you're worth, so you take it every day. You sleep when the sun comes up, rise when the sun is down. Conceal the torment with makeup and stylish hairdos. Put on your best outfits. Something arousing because you have to make them happy. The men, the tricks, the pimps. This is for the pain. This is for America. In hopes that you will notice that 12-year-old girl who was forced to trade her lunchbox and sneakers for a Chanel purse and pumps. This is for the 16-year-old girl kidnapped by a gang of men on her way to school and held captive in a house right next door to you. This is for the 20-year-old girl who took her last beating today because she couldn't bring herself to let another man hold her down and violate her. We are all slaves for love, degrading ourselves for acceptance of a man that's the closest thing to a father figure we've ever known. We were once just girls with aspirations and a small piece of hope. Now who will notice us? Who will save America's daughters? So I like I started I started using that to kind of just tie everything back together and really hone in on the fact that there's more than one way to find love. Um, because that's what we have known in doing the work that we do that makes people the most vulnerable. Um, that is all I have for you. Do I have any questions? Yes, sir. That's a very good question. Um, he asked, do we have any information and numbers regarding the amount of females that are trafficked versus males? Unfortunately, we do not. Getting information and data for trafficking victims that are female is hard enough. And a lot of males don't want to come forward and say that they have had a similar experience. on labor trafficking a bit because that's something that is surpri surprisingly large. So it's kind, of, it's kind of the same deal. The recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of forced fraud or coercion for the purposes of sub subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. So. Um, some examples of that, I've heard stories of um, mostly foreign, foreign nationals come being brought to America believing that they have a good job waiting for them. Come to find out that good job is working in the back of some restaurant for little to no pay and being controlled um, by one individual who has all of their documentation, all of their identification, those kinds of things. So it is, again, the buying and selling of people, but in this instance, it's for them to do work. 
and a lot of the time it is physical labor that they are being made to do. There, there's a couple of episodes, there's basically an episode of Law and Order SVU for just about everything I talked about today. So if you would like to take the time to do that, please do so. Because um, there is an episode that touches on labor trafficking as well. Any other questions? And I will provide you guys with my contact information. So if you do have questions and maybe just aren't comfortable asking in front of everybody, you can still get, you will still have access to me. But other than that, we are all done. job of opening our eyes to a reality and of course in an hour you can't begin to learn all that makes up the problem but it certainly gives us a starting point and the ability to